since the invention of time and the first stirrings of human memory, one story has been told by all the peoples of the world, over and over again, a hundred thousand versions of the same story. For many centuries we have marveled at the quiet regularity of the heavens, the predictable cosmic cycles, the silent clockwork motions of the stars and planets. But this first story, the mother and father of all stories, tells of an entirely different time when the planets were not distant specks of light, a time when the planets towered over the earth, immense, unpredictable, and terrifying. Once in the long ago, there was a hero, and the hero slew the dragon. To save the beautiful princess. When I was a child, I was enchanted by fairy tales. But when I was a young man in college, you couldn't have paid me to think about such things. Then I read a book by a man named Emanuel Velikovsky. Suddenly mythology became an obsession, my life's work. Little did I suspect that it would change everything I thought I knew about the history of the world. Publisher, editor, author, researcher, corporate executive, inventor. David Talbot has earned his living at diverse endeavors, but he has devoted most of his adult life to the pursuit of a single goal, unraveling the origins of the world's first story. Eight hours from now, he will present his findings at an international symposium in Portland, Oregon, to an audience of historians, anthropologists, archeologists, comparative mythologists, astronomers, and astrophysicists. Once in the long ago, heaven was close to the earth and we lived in the presence of the gods. It was the Garden of Eden, the island of Avalon, paradise on earth. That was before the sky fell, when the heavens tumbled into chaos and the gods went to war. A cosmic darkness enshrouding the world.
In the galaxy we call the Milky Way, the Earth moves with a small gathering of planets around a single star, our Sun. From where we stand, the planets are only tiny specks in the sky. So a question arises. Why did our ancestors view these pinpricks of light with such reverence and dread? We know that the first astronomers remembered the planets as immense powers in the sky, wielding weapons of thunder and fire and stone. How did this perception occur? Why did far-flung cultures celebrate the planets as the gods? Until the early 60s, our ideas about the planets came from remote observations and a lot of guesses. <laughs> then the space age arrived. We had expected our probes to reveal planets long, cold, and dead, but we found instead surprisingly recent activity on a catastrophic scale the superheated cauldron of Venus, revealing a hundred thousand volcanoes and planet-wide lava flows. The planet Mars, with continental-scale rifts and chasms, mysteriously stripped of its rivers and oceans. The moons of Jupiter and Saturn, re-sculpted by forces not a single astronomer had anticipated. Cosmic events left such colossal scars on the distant planets. One possibility is never considered. It is an extraordinary possibility that the explanation lies in the memories of the first star worshippers. Emmanuel Velikovsky's book was called Worlds in Collision. Velikovsky claimed that the mythical gods were planets and that the Earth itself was disturbed by the erratic movements of planets. Of course, the scientific establishment had completely dismissed Velikovsky. Yet I found his ideas spellbinding. I was a young man and it was an open field. So I decided to investigate these strange theories of planetary catastrophe.
venturing bravely into the vast domain of world mythology. I soon found myself overwhelmed by confusion and disillusionment. I began to fear that Velikovsky had totally distorted the subject instead of the symmetry I expected. I found an enormous jumble of absurdities. Nothing in the silent motions of Venus or Mars or the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn will ever explain the Thunderbirds or winged bulls or flaming dragons or any of the preposterous ideas our ancestors attached to these powers. Where is the shining city or temple of heaven remembered as the home of the gods? Where is the mountain of the gods, the column of fire and light rising to the center of the sky? Where is the great world wheel claimed to have once turned in the sky? something. Velikovsky had actually discovered a key. The key was recognizing patterns because patterns imply coherence and connectedness. Gradually I began to sense a peculiar resonance in our collective memory. 10,000 ancient voices urging us to remember. How did it happen that widely dispersed cultures preserve such similar stories? The universal myth of the golden age. The myth of the hero. The myth of the Queen of Heaven with her long flowing hair. There are a hundred universal themes and all are as old as civilization. But who can say we have truly accounted for any of the mythical archetypes? The mythmakers were technically skilled and highly pragmatic. They were the builders of the first civilizations. If they were not crazy or deliberate liars, how did the global themes of myth arise?
were set loose, falling into the void. The land is on fire, mountains split or crumble, rocks explode in flame, all the rivers and seas overflow and sweep across the earth, and the universe becomes a furnace burning everything. The old Norris poem, Voluspa, recalls the great catastrophe of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. When the terrifying wolf Fenrir, its jaws reaching from heaven to earth, brought forth a brood of howling wolves and the sun became blood red and vanished. And the world slipped into a winter, lasting for years. Icelandic, Aztec, Babylonian, every ancient culture seems to have remembered an event called the end of the world. We too remember the great catastrophe, but without realizing it. Around the globe we celebrate the new year with the most peculiar customs, with the beating of drums, blaring horns, exploding fireworks. We celebrate this occasion with barely a twinge of anxiety. This was not the way earlier peoples remembered the occasion. In earlier times, anxiety was nearly overwhelming because these cultures were much, much closer to the traumatic events relived in the New Year rituals, the most terrifying events in the history of man. Doomsday. A disaster of cosmic proportions. A world falling into chaos and darkness. The story was told by every ancient race on Earth. I found it so strange that no one could explain this collective memory. Using Velikovsky's key, pattern recognition, I began to search beyond the madhouse of localized mythology. I concentrated on the global themes of myth, the substructure, the archetypes. my surprise, I discovered a startling coherence and a story of vast and disturbing implications. In the catastrophe of Ragnarok, the gargantuan serpent Midgard thrashes about in the sky, his fiery venom filling heaven and earth. Greek and Roman historians recalled the attack of the great dragon Typhon, when the whole world trembled. The seas rose to flood the land. Thunderbolts flashed in the sky. Blood poured from the mountains, which split and came crashing down. And the earth was engulfed in great clouds of darkness. But the dragon is a biologically impossible monster. So what did the ancient chronicles mean by a dragon moving among the stars and disturbing the planets?
the Aztecs and Maya, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Chinese, Japanese, and Oceanic races, early British, Celtic, and Germanic nations, the Greeks and Romans, all employed the cosmic serpent or dragon as a hieroglyph for one celestial phenomenon, a comet. In ancient astronomies, the dragon and the comet carry the same meaning. They mean the end of the world, cosmic night, doomsday. Velikovsky had noticed that the most common symbol of sweeping catastrophe was the serpent or dragon attacking the world. I discovered that from one culture to another, many different hieroglyphs for the comet are attached to the serpent or dragon. Bearded dragons, fiery dragons, serpents with long flowing hair, feathered serpents. This led me to a guiding principle. When different symbols all point to the same thing, you are on the edge of discovery. But if the dragon meant the comet, and the comet meant doomsday, what about the other characters in our fairy tale? What about the hero? What about the beautiful princess? In the myth of St. George, the dragon of darkness attacks the village and carries off the beautiful princess. Then along comes the hero, St. George, who vanquishes the dragon and frees the princess. But in the earlier versions of this story, the dragon is the terrible aspect of the princess herself. So the hero is actually saving the princess from her own alter ego. In the later versions, the innocent princesses and fair maidens are often victimized by an ugly witch. And yet the witch, the devouring hag, and the ogress, like the dragon, all represent the alter ego or terrible aspect of the princess herself. And while the witch may soar across the sky with disheveled or flaming hair, she also takes the form of a serpent or fire-breathing dragon when she grows wrathful. It was said of the witch's hair that it could bring rain, hail, wind, and lightning exactly what ancient nations said of the comet. So too the witch's broom. From Europe to Asia, the clump of grass or straw or feathers, the primitive broom or whisk, was an acknowledged symbol of the comet. Are myths nothing more than the imaginings of a primitive mind? 
or are they sophisticated metaphors for the human psyche? I was beginning to sense that the myths were actually disguised descriptions of extraordinary natural events. But what events? The Doomsday Comet and the Beautiful Princess. I found myself enormously puzzled by the princess. She seemed such an unlikely symbol for a world-threatening comet. The princess of folk legends is a descendant of the more archaic goddess figures. The earlier goddess has a dual nature as radiant mother and devouring dragon. The goddess Kali of the Hindus was renowned for her beauty. But in her terrible aspect, her long disheveled tresses stretched across the heavens, blackening the sky, sweeping away the sun and the stars. We encounter surprisingly similar images in the goddess Coatlicue, of the Aztecs, the Sumerian Inanna, Egyptian Hathor, Canaanite Astarte, Greek Gorgon, Hindu Rangda, and in the medieval witch the most popular later caricature of the angry or lamenting goddess. Was the terrible goddess a spectacular fear-inspiring cometary stream? Our word for comet comes from the Greek word coma used for long flowing hair. The torch, the flame, streamers, streaming feathers, various symbols of brooms, whisks and flails. Around the world these images signify both the angry goddess and the doomsday comet. Emanuel Velikovsky believed that the Earth had been violently disturbed by the close approach of planet-sized bodies. He suggested that the Doomsday Comet was in fact an errant planet. And conventional scientists called him a madman. So I was venturing into dangerous territory. Dangerous because the deeper I went, the more the evidence seemed to support Velikovsky. The land of Sumer a cradle of civilization in ancient Mesopotamia.
prototype of the early goddess figure is the Sumerian Inanna. The texts describe her as a great dragon called the pure torch that flares in the sky. Inanna herself declares, I was the blazing, the brilliant fire. I was the fire whose flame and sparks rained down on the rebel land. I was the conflagration that shone forth in the heavens when the heavens shook and the earth trembled and quaked. Who then was this comet-like goddess, Inanna? For the very first astronomers of ancient Mesopotamia, the goddess Inanna is not an unknown cometary intruder. She is a planet. The planet Venus. In later Babylonian astronomy, the planet Venus was still remembered as the lamenting star. It was called the witch star. In the Americas, Aztec history remembered Venus as the great feathered serpent, and they called Venus the smoking star, the very phrase they used for a comet. The stargazers of Peru knew Venus as Chasca, the long-haired star, the most common phrase for the comet among ancient peoples. But the goddess wore two faces, before she acquired her terrible aspect, she shone in the sky with awe-inspiring beauty. We came to know the goddess as the Greek Aphrodite, the Latin Venus, daughter of heaven, the prototype of the beautiful princess. One of her names was Aphrodite Kameatho, the long-haired or fiery-haired Aphrodite. In the language of ancient astronomy, Aphrodite Kameatho means the comet Venus. The Greeks and Romans shared the tradition of an archetypal comet of extraordinary beauty, radiating its hair in all directions. This was the Roman portrait of that comet, a symbol of celestial power and glory. Its name was the Star of Venus. So we're not just dealing here with princesses and angry goddesses and serpent dragons that turn out to be the doomsday comet. We are confronting the mythical parent of comets, a comet inspiring both veneration and dread, a comet that turns out to be a planet, Venus. For evidence, Velikovsky had cited ancient records around the world, a completely discredited source in popular scientific opinion. Yet I too was finding such an amazing continuity in these same ancient records. And if ancient testimony counts as evidence, then all of the mythical archetypes will cry out for recognition, not just the princess, but the hero as well. In the St. George story, there is the dragon and there is the princess. Then there is St. George himself, if the princess originally meant the planet Venus, who then was St. George? From North America to Mesoamerica to South America, from ancient Mesopotamia to ancient Egypt, we see the warrior hero arising to defeat powers of chaos. The Greek Apollo, Hercules, Perseus, Theseus, or coyote or raven of Native American lore. Most of us have assumed these figures have nothing to do with astronomical bodies. Hercules was born to fight chaos monsters, vanquishing the gigantic Nemean lion slaying the Hydra. Though remembered as the child of Zeus, 
he is usually seen as a man walking the earth. But earlier versions of Hercules, the Egyptian heroes Shu'an'er or Horus, do not inhabit the earth. When they challenge the dragon of chaos, they wage that battle in the heavens. The original Hercules was a celestial power. In fact, Greek and Roman astronomy identified the warrior hero as a planet. The planet Mars. The North American Pawnee remember an ancestral warrior who defeated the powers of darkness in remote times. To find the warrior in the sky, they pointed to a planet, Mars. The Aborigines of Australia did the same. So too the Chinese, the Babylonians, and the peoples of the South Pacific. Wherever we find the doomsday theme, we find the chaos monster, the angry or lamenting goddess Venus, but also the warrior hero, the planet Mars. What conceivable events could have led to this universal memory? It would take volumes to tell the story of the warrior hero. That's because the character is so visible and so active. One can easily overlook a more passive figure in the myths, an almost forgotten personality looming mysteriously in the background. A worldwide tradition says that before a king ever ruled on earth, a prototype of kings arose in heaven father of kings, model of the good king, the universal monarch. The Aztec Quetzalcoatl, the Egyptian Ra, the Hindu Brahma. Every culture had its own universal monarch. It is said that the local king is responsible for the prosperity of the nation. In the reign of a good king, the earth flowers abundantly. Why is this? It is because the universal monarch, who set the standards of kingship, brought forth a remarkable condition in primeval times, an epoch called the Golden Age. The natives of Suriname have a poignant memory of a lost epoch. In a time long past, so long past that even the grandmothers of our grandmothers were not yet born, the trees were forever in fruit, the animals lived in perfect harmony, and the little agouti played fearlessly with the beard of the jaguar. For the Hindus, this was the Krita Yuga, or perfect age. The Iranians call it the age of the brilliant Yima, the Chinese, the age of perfect virtue. The Danish, peace of Frodi. It was paradise, the Garden of Eden. dates to the first expressions of civilization. In the great myths of the world, there is no golden age without a founding king. There is no founding king without a golden age. It was at this time that someone handed me a one and a half page summary of an unpublished Velikovsky manuscript. In this summary, Velikovsky had proposed the unthinkable. He 
He said that during the mythical Golden Age, the Earth may have been a satellite of another planet, a gas giant. He identified this planet as Saturn. According to ancient Greek poets, philosophers, and historians, the present age is just a shadow of the former epoch called the Golden Age of Kronos. But who was this ancient god, Kronos? All Greek astronomical traditions agreed that Kronos was the planet Saturn. Our own name for the planets came from the Romans. In unison, Roman poets and historians insisted that in a former time Saturn had ruled as a god king, producing a paradise on Earth. It would be almost impossible to overstate the power of this memory among the different cultures. For the Babylonians, the Hebrews, and the Greeks, the most sacred day of the week was the Sabbath, a ritual remembrance of the lost epoch. And in each of these cultures, this holiest day was the day of Saturn, the Latin Saturnidis, or Saturn's day, the Celtic day of Ceter, our Saturday. But the Golden Age did not last. In the myths of Quetzalcoatl, of Ra, and of Aum, of Kronos and of Saturn, the Golden Age does not just come to an end. It ends violently. Collapse of the Golden Age arrives the feared comet, the dragon of darkness, the fall into the cosmic night, the clash of the titans. All of the symbols of doomsday. sunrise. To the star worshippers, a symbol of the cosmic dawn, when the universal monarch, the first sun god, shone above the world. The ancient Greeks called their sun god Helios. We assume they were referring to the sun we know, the sun that rises in the east and sets in the west. But in the earliest Greek manuscripts, Helios was the name of the planet Saturn. And the Greeks were not alone. The Babylonian Shamash, always translated as Sun, was identified as Saturn. So also the Egyptian Ra, the Hindu Surya, the Latin Sol. But Saturn is a mere dot in a starry expanse. What could have caused the first star worshippers to celebrate that minute speck as the sun? Velikovsky talked about a confusion between Saturn and the sun in the ancient languages. 
I came to realize it was not a matter of confusion. For the ancients, Saturn was the revered sun god. Every day our sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But the archaic sun god Saturn did not rise or set. It did not move. Egyptian texts say of the sun god Atum or Ra, the great god lives fixed in the middle of the sky. Surprisingly, the Babylonians used almost exactly the same language to describe the sun god Shamash in the stationary center of heaven. For an earthbound observer, there is only one motionless spot in the sky, the celestial pole. The stars we see are actually cutting a circle around the polar axis, close to the star Polaris. Of course, nothing would seem more irrational than an ancient sun god at this location. And yet, throughout the Near East, the universal monarch appears as a central sun called the axis and the pole of the world. To the Hindus, the sun god Surya occupied the place of supreme rest, the motionless site. So do the Greek Helios and the Aztec Quetzalcoatl. In their earliest expressions, these figures occupy the stationary cosmic center. There is an astonishing unity to this global tradition. Ancient Iranian astronomers identified the pole as Saturn's home, and so did the Neoplatonists of Greece. Roman poets remembered Saturn as the steadfast star, and Chinese astronomers recalled that, in the beginning, Saturn was the arch premier at the celestial pole. How can this be? That the ancient sun god Saturn once stood where no sun or planet stands today. By the summer of 1972, I had gathered together all of these fascinating pieces. I could see obvious patterns, but the larger picture continued to elude me. I became fixated on one strange idea, an idea endlessly repeated in pictographs and symbols around the globe, a great crescent in the sky. Scholars have always assumed it meant the moon, but the crescent in the pictographs does not behave like the moon. On every continent, archaeologists have uncovered curious drawings of an archaic sun. They do not look like our sun, yet they are strangely similar. And most mysterious of all is the great crescent encircling the sphere of this enigmatic sun. Early Egyptian drawings place crescent horns on the sun god Ra. Mesopotamia, the crescent is repeatedly drawn wrapped around the sun god Shamash. A crescent horn turning in the sky. The image appears throughout the world. A vast crescent, unlike anything in our own sky today. Labor Day weekend, I took my family to the coast. The wind was blowing hard and the water was rough. Sitting in our cabin above the shore, I began to doodle on a piece of paper.
Late in the day, the wind died down. Everything was very still. Then it hit me. The only way you can produce a crescent with the behavior I was observing would be to place a large body at the celestial pole exactly where the ancient astronomers had placed the gas giant Saturn. Astronomy, in addition to Victor Klum, yeah, who's the yeah. Department of Astrophysics at Oxford, we have the astronomer Tom Van Flander. Okay, where's he at? Great way, welcome. Agenda, time. Catastrophe, remembered as the Great Deluge, occurred when the Earth pulled... Once Earth was assaulted by cosmic intruders. The agents of these catastrophes were planned. This one is supposed to be before this one. Okay, reverse. That should come before this one. That should be right before this yep. one. Okay, we start with night sky as seen from the Earth. Uh huh. When the first star worshippers looked out at the sky, is this what they saw as well? All of them. The revolving crescent helped me to realize something. Ancient myths and symbols don't answer to our world. It was said that throughout the Golden Age, the planet stood in line. We see the hero bringing forth a cosmic pillar or world mountain. We see Jupiter, born as if from nowhere as Saturn's son and successor. Not one original theme of myth will be explained by anything occurring in nature today. I began to sense that a unified theory was possible, a theory accounting for all of the themes of myth. But it would require that I allow for the unthinkable, the proposition that the Earth was once part of an entirely different planetary arrangement. If we take the testimony of the ancients as a literal description of actual events, the events would have looked like this. The Earth moved in a congregation of planets appearing as immense forms in the sky. Saturn was seen as a huge stationary body at the celestial pole. Venus appeared squarely in the center of Saturn and Mars appeared inside of Venus. Jupiter was there also, but hidden by Saturn. The entire system moved through a diffuse cloud of gas illuminated by our sun. On Earth, this meant that there was no clear distinction of day and night. At an early juncture, gaseous material or dust stretched from Venus towards Saturn. In periods of stability, these radiating streams appeared as a three-pointed and a four-pointed star-like pattern. Over time, the surrounding cloud dissipated. 
a more clearly defined cycle of day and night began. A bright crescent appeared on Saturn created by light from our sun. As the Earth rotated on its axis, the crescent visually turned around the polar center. The smaller planet Mars was progressively destabilized and appeared to descend from its central position as it moved closer to the Earth. It returned to the central position then descended still further growing larger with each descent. When it visually dropped below Venus, a stream of material was seen stretching between Mars and Venus. As it continued to descend, gas and dust began to extend towards Earth. Lateral displacements of both Venus and Mars occurred. Gas, ice, and debris spiraled between the two planets. Eventually, the spiraling material gathered into a band encircling Venus. As the planetary system moved through space, the appearance of the band changed dramatically. The vertical movements of Mars continued. Atmosphere and other material stretching toward the Earth with each descent. Eventually, this material reached the Earth with disastrous effects. When the skies cleared, Mars was seen moving away, the stream of gas and dust stretching upward, with Mars appearing as the apex of the illuminated column. The band encircling Venus gradually opened. four streams of comet-like material radiated once more from Venus. And material stretching from Mars to Earth retreated up the polar axis. The stable period of Saturn's domination ended with the collapse of the planetary configuration. Jupiter appeared for the first time as Saturn tumbled from its stationary position.
These events were followed by a period of great confusion and upheaval. With the displacement of Venus, the band and radiating material collapsed, spiraling between Venus and Mars, then scattering into whirl-like patterns. There was a temporary renewal of the configuration, now visually dominated by Jupiter. And only later, that the configuration fall apart, the planets moving into a new, more remote equilibrium. Though nothing could now shake my conviction in the historical argument, I could not defend it in terms acceptable to science. This was a problem I was unable to solve for 20 years. Eventually, I despaired of ever finding a solution. So in 1991, I quit. I sold my entire library, abdicating my life's work. For a year and a half, I never opened a book or once put pen to paper on the subject of myth. Then one day I received a phone call from a stranger. Mr. Talbot, he said, I think I have an answer to your dilemma. Good you again. You bet. Bob Grubaugh, a specialist in orbital mechanics, had developed a physical model supporting the thesis. It wasn't a complete answer, but it gave me confidence that the dynamical issues could be resolved. A few months later, I was back at work. From outer space and approached the Earth. And then this is the segment where we come down on these pyramids. Uh, oh, oh, yes, we've got The present arrangement of the solar system from the sun outward includes nine planets. First Mercury, then Venus, Earth, and Mars. Jupiter, then Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and finally distant Pluto. In the ancient planetary system, five planets must be reckoned with. Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Mars, Earth. This planetary configuration circled around its own center of gravity as it simultaneously revolved around the sun. planets were extremely close together, interacting with each other gravitationally. In this collinear system, the planets stayed in line. But the small planet Mars was moved by resonance into an increasingly elliptical orbit. It began to oscillate between the two larger planets, Venus and Earth. As Mars approached the larger bodies, atmosphere and oceans were pulled from its surface. Clouds of water, gas, and dust scattered into the surrounding space, then were pulled and stretched between the planets. 
the alignment grew progressively more unstable, leading to displacement of Venus, Mars, and presumably the Earth. Eventually, the result was a complete unraveling of the alignment, a dismemberment of the configuration. And so what we can see with this is that the two definitely stay lined up. And uh, they, it wanders a little bit because I'm unable to get the precision in this model that I have in my own. The, the precision of this model is only to two significant figures. But even at just two significant figures, they do. Even at two significant figures, there, so they, 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 they stay together. They stay together. They don't fly apart. They don't draw together. I'm, I'm dealing, I've been playing and, and manipulating with six significant figures to get the, the thing lined up in my model the way it's supposed to stay lined up. And it does. And it does very well. Other variations on that. On this the is, that is that not the star in the crescent, though. That is a modern thing at the Masons, isn't it? Uh, it's Islamic, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm wondering is, is I, the, how can we account for the variations in the depictions then? And would it be easy to account for them if these things were actually handed down, these drawings? I mean, nobody was out there when, when the sky was being ripped apart and floods were, were devastating everything. Nobody was out there with their sketchbook, you know. We're taking notes, right? So they were just, they were looking at you. This velocity component has a certain angle with the perpendicular to the radius. This will be the radius. Okay. And there's your velocity. Right. And this angle, this angle I call, in, in this particular model, I call it, uh, call it delta. What determines that angle? Well, what happens, what this is, you can determine where your line, where it reaches a point of center. <laughs> oh, you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. All right, well, we're Let's all set. Yeah. Ready to roll. Shall we head on out? One of the great intellectual surprises of this century will be the discovery that myth is our key to remembering. And if what we remember actually happened, then physics and astronomy are implicated no matter how extraordinary, no matter how bizarre, no matter how implausible the events may seem. Since Bob Grubaugh's unexpected phone call, others have come forward. The professor of mathematics and astronomy, Robert Bass, has shown how tidal friction, though very small, adds a stabilizing influence to a collinear configuration. And the physicist Robert Driscoll has added the principle of electromagnetism to Grubaugh's model, bringing the planets closer together. There's a comment that I got from Bob Driscoll which says that when you have these planets lined up, circling the sun, there is no rotation of the line relative to inertial space. Yeah. And so I think it's very... All right, the next speaker is David Talbot, uh, to introduce him in short scope, he is the editor of a book called The Saturn Myth, which has provided an invaluable amount of data for almost everyone working in the field. He is also the founder of the journal Aeon and one of its ma major contributors, and he is one of the chief proponents of a one of... When ancient man looked out at the night sky, is this essentially what he saw? Is it possible that just a few thousand years ago, the sky was filled with forms that towered over ancient man? The myths begin with the timeless epoch before the fall, before timekeeping references, before seasons, before the cycle of day and night. It is the golden age, the age of the great planetary conjunction. In the beginning, there was the universal monarch, the firmly seated God, the motionless sun. A God remembered as the great sphere of heaven, when the heaven was close to the earth.
the universal monarch possessed a luminous eye, heart, and soul, the mother goddess, Venus, daughter and spouse of the universal monarch. Within the womb of the goddess resided the unborn hero, Mars, heart of the heart, pupil of the eye. The goddess was the great star, radiating its comet-like hair in all directions, the celestial prototype of the beautiful princess. She was the glory of heaven, the animating flame giving life to the ancient sun god. Her place was squarely in the center of the sun. This produced the great wheel of the sun, with the goddess as the nave and the hero as the axle. As the configuration evolved, the comet-like streams gathered into three rays, remembered as the triform or threefold goddess. Later, the same comet-like material presented four streamers or rays, giving the wheel its four spokes, four luminous winds, four life-bearing streams, four flaming arrows launched into the four directions, and the four pillars of heaven. great crescent on Saturn, this crescent enclosing the central star of Venus. Saturn's crescent horns provided the celestial timepiece for the daily cycle, fading against a brightening sky as they rose to the right. Growing brilliant as they descended to the left. was born from the womb of the mother goddess and wore the goddess as a conical crown. He grew a beard. His tongue protruded.
he took the form of a dagger or peg plunged into the below. The hero consorted with the goddess, re-entering the goddess' womb as the impregnating seed, then emerging again in a new incarnation as both the goddess and the hero broke away from their original axial positions. The reborn Mars wore a spiraling sidelock, which was the goddess herself now taking on her serpentine aspect. Hero and goddess engaged in a spiraling dance about the cosmic center. The serpent tail wrapped itself around Venus to produce a band presenting the form of a great eye. So that in its re-entry, Mars became the pupil or the red apple of the eye. Saturn's golden age was interrupted by catastrophe when the enclosure of the gods was sealed shut. The descent of the hero in his dark aspect brought overwhelming clouds and darkness. was the underworld journey, the archetypal ordeal of the hero, and for the earth, a deluge of fire and water. Then Mars rose out of the waters of the deep to produce the world mountain. formed the rim of the great world wheel, the fiery body of the encircling serpent. Watered by the four rivers, this was the land of the gods, resting on the summit of the world mountain, a bright crescent forming the horned peak.
the mountain of Mars became the mooring post of the turning sky. The column of wind or water rising along the world axis. The pillar of the cosmos with its four extensions holding aloft the world wheel. But the ancient paradise did not last. The hero spirited away the goddess or stole the heart of the universal monarch who tumbled from the summit of heaven. The Golden Age gave way to the cosmic night, when the hordes of chaos were set loose and the doomsday dragon moved about in the sky, a monster created by the twisting forms of Venus and Mars. It was then that the terrible goddess appeared with wildly disheveled hair, lamenting the death of the universal monarch. In the events that follow, the hero will subdue the dragon or pacify the raging goddess. The universal monarch's own son, Jupiter, will be installed in the center of the sky. But the universal monarch has departed, and with his death comes the end of the Golden Age. All that remain are fragments of a collective memory, and hidden deep in the human psyche, a sense of something irrevocably lost, and yet eternally yearned for a paradise when heaven and earth were one. The death of this paradise was the birth of myth. For several decades now, our probes have explored the heavens, returning messages that challenge our long-held assumptions. Where we expected answers, we found mysterious contradictions. But our expectations were based on an intellectual fiction, the idea of the uneventful solar system. Can we allow for the possibility that our ancestors experienced extraordinary cosmic events, events we've simply forgotten? If we allow this idea, even as a possibility, we are inviting a revolution. One discovery will lead inexorably to another and our entire perspective on the past and the future will be forever changed. Thank you.
Thank you.